All right, good morning. Um, if you would. Well, <laughs> all right. We're going to be in Ephesians quite a bit, but um, to follow our outline. Well, I guess we'll stick to our outline primarily. But we'll be in Ephesians uh, chapters 4 and 5. Um, you can just open to Ephesians uh, chapter 4. All right, so this is going to be the final in our series on faithfulness, and then we're looking at obstacles to faithfulness. Obstacles to faithfulness. Um, what passage are you in? What passage? Uh, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Uh, it's, that's, our outline jumps around quite a bit to a bunch of different scriptures. Um, okay, so obstacles to faithfulness. There's much more than what I've listed here. This is just basically a summary of most of the excuses that I either had come across or uh, not only just from personal experience, but the folks that I've asked and then also uh, just thinking through and then seeing and then just searching scripture. But so as far as it seems kind of a little rare that you have only three, there's much more, I guess, if you wanted to go ahead and expand, but it, it's kind of, it's, encapsulizing these three, basically, as to what you would have that would be obstacles or that would be considered obstacles to uh, to faithfulness. First of all, we would see that first thing, and which is, I think is pretty obvious, would be sin. Sin in Psalm 66, we're told, uh, 18, verse 18 in particular, that if I, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the uh, Lord's not going to hear me. And sin brings forth death. That's not just for the unbeliever and how we use it in the Romans road in Romans chapter 6 but also the fact that it bring that's that's the ultimate of of sin in James chapter 1 we're told that uh, when lust hath, hath conceived it bringeth forth sin and sin what is finished it bringeth forth death that's the only product that it can never produce and death we know is a separation so in other words as a believer when I walk in sin when be it, we have here listed as known sin and unknown sin, or secret sin. Uh, known sin being obviously something I'm aware of. Now, secret sin, kind of, it's either something that you, I mean, no sin is secret. It's all known to God, regardless. But I mean, I'm either unaware of it, it'd be something that I'm either clueless about that is considered sin that God brings to my attention, and then at that point where I have it hidden from men's eyes, so it might be something in my heart uh, that men might not be visibly aware of, but the fact is God knows, and God knows our heart. And ultimately the thing is that that brings a separation. I can't walk, uh, can two walk together except they be agreed. You can't walk in fellowship uh, with God and be walking in darkness. In other words, you'll have a separation in your relationship with Him. Uh, and so known sin in your life, sin in your life is obviously going to be something that is going to be a hindrance to you being faithful uh, and ignorance of our stewardship it would be the second thing that we would look at in our outline and that is covered primarily in 1st Corinthians 6 uh, not not very many people know I know it seems kind of like silly but the thing is not very many people not very many people would be aware of the fact that um, my life is something that I'm actually obligated to live for God Okay, I, when I'm born again, uh, we're told in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 that you're bought with a price, and therefore you're to glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Uh, in 1 Peter, which we looked at last week, uh, 1 Peter 4, it talks about that we should henceforth no more um, live our life as the Gentiles did according to the flesh, but we're supposed to live it unto God. And then here's where we get into... Uh, Ephesians uh, 4. Ephesians 4, uh, starting out the first three verses. It's, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Okay? In other words, my life, he's begging here, uh, but it, nonetheless it's a command that I'm supposed to walk worthy. I've been bought with a price. I have God's name on me, and I regardless of what you want to value that, 
the fact is, because I have God's name on me, I have an obligation to him. Okay? And because I have been bought with that price, I have an obligation to him. And I am to live uh, in accord with that. And the vocation there is basically you've been called to serve God with your life. Okay, so in other words, we, when you're bought, you're bought to serve, you're bought to live for God. That's what we were originally created for, by the way. If we go back to Genesis, we were originally really created for God's pleasure. And prior to the sin, uh, prior to Adam's sin, um, the thing is we would have been living, living for God, walking with God in the garden. We would have been serving God. We would have been uh, following through on our tasks that he had given us. But uh, Adam sinned, and then we have our own sinful, uh, rebellious self. Uh, we're in Ephesians 4, I'm sorry. Ephesians 4. That we usually want to try and live for rather than living for God. And so when we live for ourselves, um, when we live, um, which it could be ignorant, it could, it could just be the fact, simple fact that you're not aware, or somebody's not aware of the fact that, hey, look, you know, I have an obligation to God. Uh, if that's the case, and then, okay, you have an awareness, or Holy Spirit, you know, um, through the Word of God, you have the Holy Spirit also convict uh, through His Word, through the preaching of the Word, that, hey, I need to give my life to God. In other words, not for salvation, but rather for if you've been saved already, uh, so that I would live for Him. And so that I live yielded on a, on a daily basis. Skip down to... Verse 17, verse 17, it says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Okay, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And here's the reason why you skip down to verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ. Okay, in other words, you are different now because you've been born again and Christ has enlightened your mind. He says the same thing if you go over to chapter 5, uh, verses 8 through 10. Chapter 5. Uh, he says, he starts off at the beginning of the chapter as far as that, um, as believers, we, it, it should not even be once named among us that we, you know, fornication or uncleanness and lasciviousness and then these other um, wicked things as far as how the Gentiles would live. And, and uh, we're not supposed to be partakers with them. Is for you were sometimes darkness, but you are now, but are but now are you uh, light in the Lord? Because that's the case. Because you've been enlightened. Because you have God's light in you. Walk as children of light. Uh, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, uh, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. All right. So darkness and light have no fellowship one with another. And so anything that would be contrary to God's truth uh, is, is basically darkness, and that's not going to be something that is acceptable to him. That's not going to be well-pleasing unto him. And so our stewardship of our life, uh, in part in that calls for me to be faithful uh, to him, not only just in, I don't think I'm pleased it here, but we'll cover that in, in the summary. Uh, of the areas as far as that my faithfulness is required or demanded. Uh, but that which is demanded of me as far as my faithfulness and my stewardship, if I'm going to be well-pleasing to God, I'm going to be seeking Him, I'm going to be yielded to Him, and I'm going to be doing that on a daily basis. And now, uh, go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Chapter 6. Uh, start at verse 19. Now, in context, this is dealing with uh, an attitude towards finances, but it's not exclusive to that. The truths still stand alone, and they and they, they actually apply to this to topic of faithfulness here. Uh, verse 19 it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. And he, 
here's something that's key that he wants you to get, and that is verse 21, for where your treasure is, there where your heart be also. Okay, this sounds familiar to what Paul wrote to the church of Colossae when he tells them that you're supposed to set your affection on things above and not on things of this earth because your life is hid with Christ. In other words, you know, Christ who is our life. We are to seek something different than what everybody else, because we are different than what everybody else does. Now, what I mean by that is we're human. We have human flesh, obviously. We still have a real strong propensity to sin. And as I yield to either my flesh or as I yield to God's spirit, which is that newness in me, um, that's what's going to be seen. But he calls us, this is, mind you, this is something that I can do. Okay, this is not something that's like impossible or something that's overwhelming, but this is something that he, he's commanded. It's an appeal to my will, so it's something that, yeah, it's possible for me to actually do to set my affections on things above and to live for God, to have something with, even though I'm living here temporally, that I have an eternal focus in mind, and that is um, placing my treasure uh, on that which is real, and in other words, on eternal on eternal things, on eternal values. Okay, verse 22. Okay, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, uh, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? In other words, if you have a focus, uh, that's good. It's going to be light. If it's bad, then it's going to be great darkness. Another key truth here, verse 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and um, love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, I don't know how many of you have either tried to live this out or have lived this out or experienced this either firsthand or have observed people like this, um, but it's just fact. Um, we're, <laughs> we're created to have basically one master, one controlling um, factor in our life. Now, it could be anything. Most people uh, live for themselves, or they have, um, you know, pleasure in mind, as far as we see that in the world. But then you have maybe people that, they're not saved, but they're very disciplined, so they have their business that uh, they're trying to promote, or they're, they're trying to uh, expand. And they do good at that, but they don't have spiritual life. And though they may be disciplined and they may have a uh, great character, uh, the fact is, you know, that's 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 what they're living for. That's what they have. But here's something that's just key across the board. Uh, that's just a key truth. Uh, you can't have a divided focus. Uh, it's basically impossible for you to be able to live for two things at once. Because um, he says here, you're either going to hate the one and love the other, or you despise the one and hold to, to the other. You know, it's impossible for you to be able to live. And here, in this context in particular, it's, uh, you can't live for money and live for God. Okay, so in other words, and what he's going to explain down is that because God is able to provide for you, then you can live for God securely and not worry about those things and not have those things consume you as far as how the Gentiles would seek after as far as what they wear, uh, where they live, and those kinds of things. Because God's able to provide for even the, the smallest of birds and we have more value than the smallest of birds. Um, and so if you live for God, then he's going to be providing for you. Uh, he summarizes that in uh, verse 33 there. It says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You know, and then verse 34, take no, therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself sufficient unto the day is the eagle thereof. That's not, <laughs> that's not an excuse to not plan, okay, by the way. That's just saying that if you're preoccupied and consumed uh, with the infinite um, hypotheticals, then, you know, you're, you're basically wasting your life. In other words, God's able to take care of those things. That's, that, that's not a call to irresponsibility, but that's basically, because we are supposed to be
people that plan and look to the look to the future. But in other words, we we live different because God is our Father. He's the one that provides for us. We look to Him for provision. So we need we need to live by faith. We need to trust Him uh, to be our provider. That's what He's that's what He's getting at. But the, the key truth here: you cannot serve God and man. In other words, you can't have two masters. Uh, it's impossible for you to live having two masters. James says that in a sense, even though in James 1 where he talks about where if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, uh, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. But he also says that let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Uh, because he says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Uh, having a split focus, being double-minded, uh, being somebody that wavers is not uh, conducive to obviously being faithful or having blessing of God in your life. Uh, go to Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes 12. So let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. Okay, so Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes, uh, wrote it particularly with the intent to communicate that truth at the end of it. But he wrote it with the perspective of this is life under the sun. So in other words, it's life from a human perspective without God involved. And his summary conclusion of it is that life is vanity. That's something that you're going to see repeated constantly if you read through it. That all life, it's vain. It's vain. It's temporary. It's here today, gone tomorrow. There's no point to it. Uh, you know, he tried everything that you can try. Uh, he had, you know, 700 wives, 300 concubines, which I don't know why he would <laughs> need more than one wife, but uh, he was disobedient to God in those areas. He pursued wealth. Uh, now, mind you, God had blessed him with an incredible amount of wealth and wisdom just because he had a heart toward God, and he had prayed whenever he was given, uh, whenever he, he stepped into uh, his rulership his kingship uh, for an understanding heart to be able to rule his people well. Uh, so God had blessed him with not only just material blessing as far as finances, but a great amount of wisdom. He was the wisest man on earth. Uh, he was blessed in so many ways. But he readily admits in, in, um, in Ecclesiastes that he had pursued all manner of pleasure that you could find out under the sun. And then he comes to the conclusion that it's all vanity. In other words, it's, there's no point to it. So life under the sun, apart from God, is vanity. It's worthless. There's no point to it. Uh, so he concludes by saying, the only point to life is a life that's lived for God. In other words, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You're going to find that even if you go and live your life say you're given 80 years on this earth, uh, or even longer than that, that, uh, you know, you have children and they're not accused of unruliness or riot, you know, they, they become productive citizens, they, you know, maybe have their own business or they work for somebody that, you know, uh, of a reputable business and, you know, okay, they have their home. I guess what we would think of as the American dream. Uh, you know, you own your own home. You got money in the bank to be able to go ahead and retire. Now, mind you, I'm not against those things. That's true. That's true. You know, they have their place. But the fact is that when everything's said and done, that's still just temporal. That's just for here. If you've not made any investment with regard towards eternity and put any time in towards eternal things, then that's all you have. That's wasted. You're going to stand before God, basically either having nothing to offer or what you did have to offer would be just wood, hay, stubble to be burned. 
for him. Okay, so it's in a sense basically a wasted life. Um, go to Mark chapter eight. Mark chapter eight. went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi and by the way he asked his disciples by the way in other words they're walking along the pathway uh, that they're walking on and then he asked who do men say that I am okay so a pop quiz who do people say that I am um, and here's what their responses were John the Baptist but some say Elias, that's Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he said to them, okay, that's fine, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say? I want to know what you guys think. All right? And then uh, it says, Peter answered and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. Okay? And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Okay, and he spake that saying openly. And Peter took him, in other words, took him aside, and began to rebuke him. Uh, now, I know it seems kind of silly, but why do you think that would be the case? Why would it's been prophesied? that Messiah would come and that he would be cut off and he would be cut off for the sins of the people. In other words, not for his own sins. Because he, he couldn't commit sin to begin with, but uh, obviously he didn't commit sin. Uh, that's prophesied very clearly in Daniel. That's also prophesied in Isaiah and other portions of Scripture that Messiah would be cut off. So why? And he just admitted to them, hey, look, I know you're Messiah. Right? That You're Christ. You're the one that's prophesied to come that's going to offer yourself up for our sins. Why would he take him aside and rebuke him? Because he's thinking about the kingdom right then and there. Yeah, basically. He's saying, why, you know, in other words, you're here, we know Messiah is coming, he's going to restore Israel, and you're going to reign and rule. Okay? Now, mind you, it's also prophesied as well that he was going to be cut off, and that was well known, but they didn't want to hear that. Okay, and in particular him, he didn't want to hear that. You're here right now, you can restore Israel right now. So what are you doing? What are you thinking? And then uh, verse 33. But when he turned us and when he turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, No, mind you, he does this publicly. Peter took him aside and rebuked him privately. Okay, so now when he waits for the other disciples to come along, is that's that's when Christ like openly rebukes. Peter before them all. He says, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Okay, interesting perspective from Christ here. Okay, what is appealing about dying on a cross? Nothing. Okay, what's appealing about, you know, losing the person that you've been waiting for, I guess you could say your whole life, that is going to restore Israel, he's going to be the king. Right? The person that has been leading and guiding you for the past three years, that's been providing everything for you. And there's nothing appealing as far as that's concerned. But he says, those things are of God. In other words, Christ's perspective is, this is, this is God's will, this is what God wants. And you don't, in other words, basically, you don't, you don't have a heart for God. You don't, you don't, you're not desirous of God's will for your life. And then verse 34 says, When he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, 
Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And Luke, it says, take up his cross daily. Um, and then verse 35, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. Now, I know we use this a lot for soul winning, verse 36, but in context it's actually a rebuke towards <laughs> carnal-minded or, or temporal-minded Christians, because that's who he was addressing, basically, the believers, um, the disciples in particular that had been following him. And he says in verse 36, For what shall a profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? All right, now, that's interesting that he would say that to believers. So how is it that you lose your soul as a believer since we have eternal life? And they were, well, they, to, at that point, had been sealed with the Holy Spirit promise. So it's not like they could have been rejected, but the fact is they were believers. In other words, he's saying that you have a wasted life as a believer uh, if you live for the things that are not of God, for basically those things that are temporal. In other words, you, it's, it's a waste of your life to live for anything but for God's will, is, is, what, he's, is, what, he's, is what, he's, um, what he's communicating. Go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Verse 17, start at verse 17. And when we were come to Jerusalem, uh, the brethren received us gladly, and the day following Paul went in. Oh, excuse me. I'm a chapter over. Okay. Um, and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. This is Paul making his way to Rome. Um, actually, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's trying to make his way to Jerusalem. And then he's going to be at Jerusalem, caught in prison, and then eventually he's going to be made his way to Rome. But this is on his way to Jerusalem. Um, so he, 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 he departs from where he was originally, and he comes to Miletus. And he says, okay, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, you know... From the first day that I came to Asia, after what manner I have been with you all seasons, or at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, and how be and now, behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Well, he, he is going to be, that is going to be made known to him. Okay, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Uh, but none of these things move me. And take note of this. It says, neither count on my life for dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. All right. So, this is Paul addressing the elders that are in the um, city of Ephesus, um, along with the believers there, and he's going to basically say, hey, look, I I'm, I'm, don't know what's going to happen. I'm probably going to end up dying when I go over there. Uh, so, he's going to commend them to God. So, he's basically transferring... Uh, responsibility because he was an apostle. He was an apostle to the Gentiles, and particularly they, because of being the foundational gift, he was the one that was responsible for the people born again in that area and training them and equipping them basically as a church. And so they they looked to him. But now what he's saying is, look, I'm gonna. If we were to read down further, he's gonna he's gonna commend them to God and say, look, I'm entrusting you to God and you. And now you take your leadership just directly from the Word of God, as I have taught you, and basically from the Holy Spirit as He guides and leads you all as you're serving the Lord. But He mentioned something here in particular that is a mindset that we should have uh, towards our life and towards um, 
toward, basically towards the things of God, to what God has called us to. And that is this, he says, um, he's facing, you know, possible death. Now, he's free at this time, but in other words, he's, he's going to Jerusalem. He feels that it, it's necessary for him to go to Jerusalem. Um, now, that could be argued as to whether or not that was the Holy Spirit that was leading him, or whether or not that was his own personal desire to go there. But at any rate, the fact is he felt impressed to go to Jerusalem, and he fears, okay, I don't, I actually, I really don't know what's going to happen other than the Holy Ghost has been telling me you're going to be bound, all right, you're going to be in prison while you're there, and, you know, there's a chance he's possibly even going to die, he's just thinking of the possibilities there, um, but he says, none of these things move me, and then neither count I my life dear unto myself. Um, now, because of the fact that it would be you know, conjecture as to it may be if it was his personal desire or whether it was the Holy Spirit's leading. Uh, it could be argued, okay, that's poor stewardship on your part. But the fact is, if God's called you to something and it's God's leading specifically, okay, in other words, your one, your life is not your own. Um, and I'm not saying being reckless or be foolish as a steward, but the fact is, this is this is a mindset that we should have. Um, he says, neither count on my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. And we, If you're a believer here, you've been gifted by God and you have received a call on your life. You have a ministry that God wants to place you in if you're not actively involved uh, or if you are actively involved, he wants to grow that. He wants to develop yet. He's trying. He's grooming each and every one of us now for what he wants us to do. Uh, that might be short-lived. It might be long-lived. Uh, but I have to approach my life as something that it's one. It belongs to God, so it's something that is valuable. Two, uh, I need to be a good steward of it because it's not mine anymore. It's actually God's. I'm entrusted with it. And then three, uh, he, he doesn't count it. He says, neither count I my life dear unto myself. In other words, you know, if God calls me to give it up. In other words, he's looking at, God, you want to take me home what would be considerably early, I guess you could say, then that's fine. That's okay by me. Why? Because my life's not my own. It's, it's God's. So what he directs, what he says, what he commands, I'm actually obligated to follow. But I should have a cheerful disposition about it. In other words, I don't clench it unto myself. It's not mine. It's, it's actually God's. So what he calls or what he says or what he wants, what he directs with it, is what I'm to do with it. Okay? And that's, that's one of the primary th uh, obstacles, I believe, to faithfulness is having a misplaced priority. In other words, my life's mine to do with what I want. And when your desire and God's desire are not congruous, okay, most people take, well, I'm, I'm going to do what I want. It's my life. It isn't. It's God's life. Okay? <laughs> he rescued you. Okay? It's not your body to do with as you please. You know, it's His. And we, you know, we don't, we don't really have a say in that matter. And the fact is, if we're going to be pleasing to God, we're going to be able to stand before him and not have, uh, as he told Peter, you know, a wasted life. Uh, what, you know, what, what's a profit? Well, it doesn't profit anything if you, you know, lose your life. But the thing is, the, the ones that lose it for him and for the sake of the gospel are the ones that actually save it. What he means by that is that in other words, that's where you're going to find value, worth, not just here temporally, but actually eternally. In other words, you'll have reward in heaven for that, living your life for the gospel's sake, living your life for God. Um, these things that we seek after, uh, the comfort and all that, now, that's not to say that God wants us to live a miserable life. Okay, that's not to say, um, I don't know how many times I've heard this when I was in college, but like, um, 
a lot of times, like at mission conference, you'd have individuals that would come, and then they would, some of them would serve in more primitive uh, fields. So they'd be like, oh. I remember one individual in particular that was actually serving in Suriname, like out in the bush, like out, like out in the middle of nowhere, in Suriname, which is pretty primitive, uh, even though it has somewhat modern cities. Uh, with Suriname is in uh, Northeast South America, but he had lived in Congo, uh, Africa, for like, well, more than 10 years, but they had served actively for about 10 years before they were kicked out uh, during Civil War time. Uh, and back there, where they were, you know, the region where they were at, it was relatively primitive. They ran across a lot of individuals that were like illiterate. And so they had multiple languages that they would have, like you would have their one tribal language, you would have like a common, um, which for them whenever they were governed under um, Belgium basically, they, they would, French would have been the primary language that they would have had as far as uh, that would have been instructed and then they would have had, I guess you could say as a trade language and then you would have maybe other tribes that were around and so you would have those other languages or whatnot. So, um, but most of the individuals, it wasn't like they weren't intelligent or they couldn't speak, it's just they weren't a lot of times educated so that they would have to, you know, make people literate you now. And they, you know, didn't have running water. You know, you gotta go catch your food to eat. <laughs> and just basic things that you would think, okay, that we take for granted here that they don't have, that they're, they're living back to, not quite Stone Age, I'm saying that for hyperbole, but I'm just saying it's just really rough conditions as far as living. So then you think on that, and then plus the disease uh, factor, catching malaria and other, other types of diseases that are uh, more prevalent over there than what we would have over here. Folks look at that and it's like, man, God wants to call me over there and make my life absolutely miserable. Well, the truth is that your life you know, could be just as miserable over here. And the fact is, if, if God's called you there, then he's going to provide for you. And that's not to say that, okay, you know, it's going to be absolute misery over there. You know, wherever you're at, as far as in God's will, that's actually the place where you're going to be most fulfilled at, because that's, that's what you're made for. That's what you're designed for, is God's will. And so, just because, good morning. Because we are uh, yo, yo. We were in Acts chapter 20, but we were just finishing up. Um, so wherever God had called, where, wherever God calls you, the fact is that's that's your place of service, that's where you're gonna be most fulfilled, and that's where you're gonna find your life if you give it for Him and for the Gospel's sake. Uh, so a misplaced priority is gonna keep you from being uh, faithful to God. When we regard our lives dear on ourselves, we esteem God to be not worthy of it. Okay? In other words, when I hold my life dear to myself, or when I prioritize anything other than God's will, it's basically saying, God, you're not as valuable, or you're not. We wouldn't think of it as such, but that's actually the case. You know? You're not, you're not worthy of my time, of my life, of whatever. And mind you, he's given you those things. Those aren't yours. <laughs> those are actually his. But you're not worthy of this. You know? You you take second place, you're <coughs> second rate, you know, or maybe even whatever last place. But the fact is you're not you're not worthy of it. And it's as if we place ourselves as God in our life. We're our own God rather and that's idolatry, by the way. And it rather than having him be the rightful place, which is first and foremost preeminent. So that leaves us with just two choices, either pleasing him or pleasing ourselves. If we're going to be faithful, um, we need to make a purposeful, determined choice on a daily basis that, one, God is going to have priority uh, in everything, and then I need to structure my life so that what God has called me to is 
what is prioritized to, to be done. Does it make sense? Now, some of the priorities that we would have, obviously a relationship with him. You know, I need to structure my life so that I am in God's word on a daily basis to be able to hear from him, to communicate with him, uh, to take time to pray, obviously. Uh, you have parents that are still alive. I would be in communication with them. Um, you have children. You know, if your children are still alive, then as a parent, now mind you, they may not be under your authority as far as in the home. Maybe they're adult children, they've moved away, or they've started their own families. Uh, but you have a responsibility, you know, you have a responsibility even after the fact to live a good example for them, set a good example for them. Uh, not only, obviously in the younger years when you're training them up on the nurture and admonition of the Lord, but also after the fact as far as to encourage, to provoke unto love and good works. Um, now mind you, you also have responsibility uh, to the lost. Uh, and you'd say, okay, how so? You know, <laughs> the fact is God's called us uh, to be witnesses unto him. Not just here, but both Jews. Uh, and he tells us in Acts 1.8 that both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and until the uttermost parts of the world, until the most parts of the earth, uh, the lost need to hear of Christ because that's who's going to change their life. Now, mind you, it's not about behavior modification. The thing is, God wants to save their soul from an eternal hell. And that happens. He's entrusted us which is another responsibility we have, with the ministry of reconciliation. And he's entrusted us with the word of reconciliation. And so we need to go and actively try and engage folks within our sphere of influence with the gospel. Because God wants to save them and use their life too. He has a plan for them. And that's not going to be realized unless we are active in our part and being able to pursue them and seek them out. And by the way, we also have a responsibility to our church. And that is uh, not the building, but the people, the members. Uh, and why that's the case is because you've been gifted by God in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 and Romans 12 uh, with a particular gift in Ephesians 4. Uh, it also tells us with regard that he's not only just gifted some as far as apostles and prophets, but for perfecting the saints as we mature, as we yield. Uh, and then being involved in the work of the ministry. We're all a cohesive unit. We're all a body part in God's body. And the thing is, if we're not doing our part, then uh, we're, you know, something's going to be lacking. And so we have a responsibility to our brethren. Uh, we're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to provoke one another to love and good works. Uh, as, as in Hebrews, we're told. And so we, we look at these responsibilities, if we're going to be faithful to them, uh, I need to make an active choice daily that says, God, you have first place uh, to guard my heart from those things that would influence my attention and my focus away from that which is eternal. And uh, now, mind you, we obviously live here in the temporal, and we have responsibilities that we have to keep here. But if I'm not focused on that which is eternal, then the fact is I end up walking in a way that is not going to be uh, well pleasing to God. All right. Uh, does anybody have any questions? No? Okay. Uh, we're dismissed.